Welcome to Connected Lab at WPI, video tutorial for LB Agar plate preparation and pouring. Section 1, Materials and Ingredients. You will need distilled water, a 500 milliliter graduated cylinder, a 500 milliliter bottle, sterile plates, a funnel, weigh trays, scoops, a stir plate, aluminum foil, and an autoclave tape. You will also need the ingredients 5 grams of yeast extract, 10 grams of peptone, 5 grams of sodium chloride, and 7 grams of agarose. Section 2 Procedure For best practice, begin by labeling your 500 milliliter bottle with the future contents, the date, and your initials. Remember, labeling is very important, not only for yourself, but for others working in the lab as well. To begin, take a 500 milliliter cylinder. We'll fill this up with about 450 milliliters of distilled water. Though we are ultimately making a 500 milliliter solution, we need to leave room for the primary ingredients. Once the primary ingredients are added, we will add some more distilled water to top off to 500 milliliters. In order to measure out the proper quantities of ingredients, we'll use a scale. Once the scale is turned on, place a clean weigh tray on top. Naturally, the tray has its own mass. Press the zero button to remove this mass from the measurement. But you can add them in any order. We'll begin by adding 5 grams of yeast extract. Carefully add your ingredients bit by bit to the weigh tray until you reach your desired mass. Be as accurate as you can, more accurate than shown here. Next, we'll add the peptone. It's best practice to use a clean new weigh tray for each ingredient. Remember, re-zero the scale with each new weigh tray. Never pour the ingredients onto the weigh tray. Always use a scoop. Some ingredients can easily become airborne and can irritate the lungs and respiratory tract. With our first three ingredients ready, we'll use a stir plate like this one to mix them all together. It will stir whatever you want by spinning a small magnetic stir rod like this one. Right now, this is only spinning air, but normally we place it inside the solution we want to stir and then turn the stir plate on. Now everything is ready to mix the first three ingredients together in the distilled water. You'll notice that the 450 milliliters of distilled water we measured earlier has already been added to the 500 milliliter bottle. We must take extreme care when adding our ingredients to the distilled water, and in that case, there is no shame in using a funnel. We'll turn the stir plate on before we add any of the ingredients to help prevent the formation of clumps. The weigh trays can be bent from corner to corner and then tapped lightly, giving you finer control when adding the ingredient to the solution. Give your funnel a final tap, too, to help knock off any clinging ingredients. You probably noticed that some of the ingredients never came off of the weigh trays. We can give them a quick rinse to get those ingredients into the solution. With these three ingredients stirred into the solution, we'll return it to the graduated cylinder.
You'll notice that the solution is now more than the original 450 milliliters of water that we measured out in the beginning, since we've added the ingredients. Good thing we left room, right? Now add a little distilled water to top off to 500 mils. With everything topped off and ready to go, we'll return the solution back to the 500 milliliter bottle. Take extra care here. Liquids often pour out of the graduated cylinder faster than many people would expect. With the solution returned to the bottle, we'll be able to add the final ingredient, the agar itself. You know the drill. Turn scale on, place weigh tray, press zero button, and carefully add your ingredient. As with the other ingredients, add the agar to the solution with a funnel. However, there is no need to use a stir rod, as the agar won't dissolve. We'll need to autoclave it first, to make the solution homogeneous. Before autoclaving our solution, we'll need to prepare the bottle with aluminum foil and autoclave tape. We can start, of course, by putting the cap on the bottle. An important note, however, do not tighten down the cap all the way. Keep it loose on the bottle. This is because in the autoclave, great pressures in the chamber will build up, and if the cap is tight, they will remain low on the inside of the bottle and could cause the glass to crack. The aluminum foil helps to prevent contaminants from entering the bottle after it has been autoclaved and before the cap has been tightened down. The primary function of the autoclave tape is to indicate that the bottle has in fact been autoclaved with stripes that change color to black after it has been autoclaved, though it serves a secondary function to hold the cap and everything together. The concept of the autoclave is easy enough to understand, but nonetheless can be dangerous to operate, so use the utmost care. There's a host of signage surrounding the autoclave, and be sure to review it all, as well as consult your instructor before using the device. A general overview of how to use the autoclave will be completed here. Before opening the autoclave, we must check that it is safe to do so. Before the chamber can be opened, the pressure must be equalized for the environment. Use the check heat button to make sure that the chamber temperature is around room temperature. With this information verified, we can safely open the chamber. The autoclave sterilizes by producing hot steam under pressure. In order to do that, however, it requires water to produce steam from. In this kind of autoclave, water fills the very base of the chamber, just below the shelf, around the heating element. Make sure that there is enough water to produce steam within the autoclave. Much of the excess steam is exhausted into a reservoir. Make sure the reservoir is not too full or too empty. Cylindrical baskets stack within the autoclave, forming shelves or layers in which objects to be sterilized can be placed. While it is certainly more efficient to fill each basket and sterilize many things at once, as the autoclave uses much energy and takes time, we will only be sterilizing our media for the purpose of this demonstration. With everything good to go, we can seal the chamber. Tighten the door, but there is no need to over-tighten it. Be sure the door is openable after the cycle has completed. Verify with your instructor that all the settings for autoclaving are optimal. Also, be sure to verify that the exhaust is closed. When everything is ready, the autoclave can be started. Once the process is completed, we can remove the contents of the autoclave once the chamber pressure has been verified to be ambient, along with the temperature being at or around ambient temperature. With that verified, we can open the chamber and remove our contents. But be careful, even though the chamber temperature is normal, the contents may be hot to the touch. 
Before we actually pour plates, we'll want to get the temperature of our media down to about 50 degrees centigrade. Therefore, we'll place it in a 50 degrees centigrade water bath. Be sure the cover of the water bath is closed securely. Once the media has cooled down, we'll give it up a quick stir to make sure everything is mixed up nice and good. By the way, this is the same stir rod as we had before the autoclaving process. We never took it out, so don't put another one in. With everything stirred up nice and good, we can now begin to pour the plates. We'll begin by flaming the mouth of the bottle. This is to help reduce the chance of contamination. The hot glass causes air around it to rise, preventing dust from falling in. With that, we can now begin to pour the plates. Take your plate, turn it over, and fill it about halfway with media, something like 20 milliliters, just to cover the bottom. Promptly return the cover, and voila! You will have poured your very first plate.